So as usual, we will start by tackling the first most basic learning outcome. What is soil? You probably already have an intuitive sense of what soil is. It's the matter found on the immediate surface of the earth, and it consists of multiple components. There's mineral matter. You might think of this as dirt. There are three types of mineral matter, which are sand, silt, and clay. And we'll talk more about each of these in a moment. Soil also contains decaying organic matter, so dead decaying plants and animals. The technical term for this is hum humus. Then between all of these particles of mineral matter and organic matter are pores. And these pores are filled with the water or air um, present in the soil. How much water and how much air varies depending on the soil type. And then lastly, among all of these things, soil also contains living organisms, such as microbes and insects that inhabit the material. The soil is, is its own ecosystem. So these are the standard features in the composition of the soil, but not all soils are the same. There are many types of soils, which we will get into in a moment. But before we do, a brief aside on the importance of the role that soils play in the environment. Soil is crucial for life on Earth. As you probably know, soil provides plants with nutrients as well as a place to anchor their roots. And of course, plants are the producers that the rest of the ecosystem relies on as the gateway for new energy from the sun. Soil also plays other roles in the biosphere, though. It filters water and air. It stores and recycles carbon. And in a later section of this chapter, we will also be taking a look at the carbon cycle. And it recycles other nutrients as well. So needless to say, soil is a very important resource. And to fully understand how it functions as such a resource, we need to know a bit about the parts that compose it and also where it comes from and how it is created. The formation of soil is, long, is a long process that is both biological and geological in nature. It involves transforming rocks and organic materials into the complex matter we know as soil. The process, excuse me, the process starts, um, if we back up here, with what's called weathering of the parent material. The parent material is the matter that the soil originates from. Often, this is the solid bedrock that underlies the geography of the region. Weathering occurs as a result of many factors simultaneously, including freezing and thawing, erosion of the material by wind and water, and invasion of plant roots that penetrate the parent material and break it up into smaller pieces. As the parent material breaks down and organic matter accumulates, the soil begins to form distinct layers that are called horizons. These layers are distinguished both by what they are composed of and where they are located. The topmost layer of the soil is called the O-horizon or the organic layer. It's made of organic materials in various stages of decay, including fallen leaves, dead plants, etc. Not all soils have an O horizon, and in the case of a lot of agricultural operations, the O horizon is stripped away by plowing. Beneath the O horizon is the A horizon, which is also known as the topsoil. This layer is a blend of organic material and mineral particles. It's also often rich with microorganisms. This is the primary layer that supports the growth of plants. Next down is the E horizon, or the alluviation leaching zone. The word alluviation is used to refer to the washing out of minerals and nutrients from the soil by water. So the alluviation zone is an area below the A horizon marked by sort of a bleached appearance because in this strip, strip the nutrients have been washed away by water and it makes its way deeper in the soil profile. Not all the soils have this E horizon. It's a feature of soils that have good drainage and also in agricultural fields. If plowing takes place, then the E horizon mixes with the A horizon and does not form. Moving down from the E horizon is the B 
B horizon. This is called the subsoil. The subsoil is where the stuff that has leached out of the A horizon and passed through the E horizon accumulates. Then finally, below the B horizon is the C horizon, or the parent material. This is the source of the mineral material, so the clay, sand, and silt that mixes with the organic material in the above layers. And an important feature to note in this diagram, on the left at least, is you can see how beneath the parent rock is the unweathered bedrock. So, whereas... This illustration kind of makes it seem like soil formation takes place in a geographic area and then you have soil forever. That's not actually how it works at all. Soil formation is a continuous process that is always happening. The O and the A layers get washed away by erosion and the parent material and the subsoil continues to undergo weathering and turns into the new O and A layers. And all of this happens very gradually, but nonetheless continuously over the course of decades and even centuries. So now that we understand where soil comes from, we're going to transition to talking about what it is made of in a bit more detail. We can think about soil as being divided into three phases, a solid phase, a liquid phase, and a gaseous phase. Organic and mineral material are both considered to be part of the soil phase of soil because they are made of solid matter. The liquid phase of soil is the water found in the pores between solid particles. And the gas phase of soil is the air found in the pores between particles. We're going to look at each of these components one by one. Starting with the mineral material, which is one of the two pieces of the solid phase. So as we've said, the mineral material is what we might think of as the dirt. There are three major categories of mineral material, and those are sand, silt, and clay. These three categories differ based on their size, and then their size variation in turn imparts certain qualities on the soil. Sand is the largest of the three particles, ranging from 50 to 2,000 micrometers in size. The upper end of that range is about the thickness of a nickel. Silt is mid-range in size, 2 to 50 micrometers, and clay is the smallest of the three clay part uh, of the three. Clay particles are less than 2 micrometers, which is about the diameter of a single bacterium, so very very small. As you can see in the figure on the right, the different sizes of these particles cause them to pack differently together. With the sand, there's a lot of space between the particles. This means that if you have a soil where the mineral portion contains a high level of sand, the soil has, ha uh, has good drainage. But this means that if you um, consequently consequently um, have poor water and nutrient retention because these things tend to flow right through it along with the water. A silty soil, being in the mid-range in particle size, has moderate drainage and retention of water and nutrients, while a soil that is rich in clay has poor drainage because the clay particles are so small that they pack together very tightly without much space in between. But on the other hand, clay also retains water and nutrients very well. In reality, almost no soil is pure clay, silt, or sand. It's a blend of these three in varying proportions. So this means there aren't just three types of minerals, but rather there are many types of soil textures that represent different proportions of the three mineral forms. And there's this graphical tool called the soil texture triangle that is used to classify a soil based on those proportions. To use the soil texture triangle, you need to know the percentage makeup of your soil in terms of the three mineral components. This can be done very precisely with laboratory testing or more roughly with a simple home test where you 
put a sample of soil in a glass jar with water and let it settle. And as it settles, we'll do so in three layers with the largest particles, the sand on the bottom, and then the silt, and then the clay particles on top. This can give you a breakdown of the percentages of each uh, mineral. So if the soil has 10% clay, 30% silt, and 60% sand, as highlighted here on the triangle. Um, you find the 10% on the side corresponding to the clay, the 30% on the side corresponding to the silt, <clears throat> and the 60% on the side for the sand. Then you follow the lines that are on the grid in the triangle. And you'll notice that the lines are, are uh, kind of fl flowing towards each other, okay? And where, where they intersect, that point where you land is the classification of the soil, um, the text written within the, within the triangle. So the one in this example would be considered a sandy loam soil. Now, why does this all matter? Well, soil texture has consequences for what type of plants grow well in that soil. Plants that thrive in a well-drained soil are not going to do well in clay. Well, while um, clays that need plants that need high levels of nutrients won't like sand. While this isn't a universal rule, soil in the loam texture classification are generally considered to be ideal for many agricultural purposes because they have a good balance of the qualities of the three mineral types. Now, remember that the minerals are just one of the two pieces of soil solid phase. The other part is the organic material. There's three things that are considered part of the organic material of soil. The first is live biomass. In other words, the still living organisms like plant roots and microbes that, in that inhabit the soil. Second is recognizable dead matter meaning dead plant and animal remains that haven't fully decomposed. Then lastly, there's humic substances, or just humus. Humus is what you get when organic matter is pretty much fully decomposed. It's dark, it's rich, it's fertile, and full of nutrients. This is what you see pictured in the image here, the humus. Moving on to the next phase of soil, the liquid phase, refers to the water that you find in soil and the stuff that's dissolved in that water. Water is crucial to soil for many reasons, including the fact that it supplies plants with water, it regulates the temperature of the soil and keeps it from reaching extreme high or low temperatures. It provides a habitat for microscopic organisms. It buffers plants from exposure to harmful chemicals. And it transports nutrients throughout the soil medium. While we are on the topic of liquid and soils, one factor that is important to discuss is soil salinity. Salinity is the technical term for salt concentration. And the salt concentration found in a soil has an influence on how well the plants grow in that soil and can absorb water and nutrients. In particular, soils with very high salinity, such as the one that you see in the image here, where the salinity is so high that a salt crust is developed over it. These types of soils are characterized by poor nutrient uptake by the plants that live in them. So why does salt have this effect? Well, the simplified explanation is that many essential nutrients that plants need to survive are ions, including calcium, magnesium, potassium, and ammonium. Remember from chapter two, Ions are particles with an electrical charge, and salts are also made of ions. The, they are ionic molecules. So when you get really high concentration of salts in a soil, there is such a sheer volume of ions that the balance is thrown out of whack, and the plants can't get access to the essential important ions that they need, nor can they properly absorb water out of the soil. Another factor that can impact the, the absorption of, of water and nutrients by plants is soil pH. Because remember, pH is essentially a measurement of ions as well, specifically 
hydrogen ions. So too many or too few hydrogen ions and the balance can be disrupted and the plant finds itself unable to absorb water and essential nutrients. This pH factor is a bit more variable though because some plants are well adapted to soils with either acidic or basic pH levels. For example, blueberry bushes prefer an acidic soil with a pH around five or less. Here in Arizona, our soil is basic, not acidic. As you can see from this map that lays out the different soil pH ranges in regions across the globe. So the only way you can successfully grow a fruiting blueberry bush is by putting it in a pot with special acetic soil because the native soil with its basic pH will not allow the blueberry bush to thrive. The last dimension of the three phases of soil that we need to talk about is the gas phase, or in other words, air. In a soil that is well aerated, the air that is found in the pores between the particles of soil solid phase look more or less the same as the air in the atmosphere. That is, mostly made of nitrogen with a significant amount of oxygen and also carbon dioxide. That's because gases will readily move in and out of the pores found in soil through a process called diffusion which is the movement of molecules from areas of high concentration to low concentration. So if the air content of soil is being depleted by the metabolism of soil organisms, as long as the soil is well aerated, then more gas will move in and replenish what's being used up. However, as long as the soil is well aerated, this will happen. Uh, in soil that is not well aerated, such as soil that has a high proportion of clay minerals, or soil that is waterlogged, like what you see in this photo, the proportions of gases can look a lot different um, because the metabolism of the living things in the soil will absorb certain gases, but new fresh gases from the atmosphere won't be able to flow in. Uh, for example, the bacteria and other heterotrophic microorganisms in the soil, as well as the roots of plants, will go about their normal metabolism conducting cellular respiration to extract energy from carbohydrates. And you may remember that cellular respiration uses oxygen as an ingredient. So the oxygen in the soil pores will get used up. But if there's poor airflow in the soil, then it won't be replenished. And that can spell death for the plants and many of the organisms that live in that soil. And many of the microorganisms that uh, require, that, that can only do cellular respiration are beneficial organisms to the plants as well. So this is why having well aerated soil is so important for agriculture and practices like tilling the soil or adding source of organic matter that breaks up the mineral content and increases the so size of pores in the soil like adding compost or manure for example. These are a couple of practices that promote better aeration. <laughs>